Well, good afternoon on this Ash Wednesday. Uh, we're so glad that you have chosen to join us this morning. This is an important day because it brings about a, a raw and realness to the gospel in our perspective of it. And I'm excited to dig into the heart of, of what Ash Wednesday is with you this afternoon. But let me pray for us and we'll jump right in. God, we thank you for the God that you are, that you are a God who loves us, loves us so much that you would send your son to put on the sins of the world, to die on a cross, and then praise you, God, that it didn't end there. He conquered death. Because of that, we have a hope that goes far beyond our time here on earth. So Lord, we thank you that you love us. We thank you for the grace that you show us. And we thank you for the opportunity to gather together, as Dan said, with millions of Christians to remind ourselves that you are God and we are not. We pray all this in your name, amen. Well, I remember my first real encounter with death. And coincidentally, this came around the same time that my mom thought it would be a good idea for me to have my first pet to teach me responsibility. I was six years old, it was time. And cue the cuddly, fluffy, adorable hamster Bevo. Uh, around the same time this happened, around the same time that I got Bevo, there was a Disney Channel original movie that came out called Johnny Tsunami. And if you've never heard of it or seen it, it's about a, a teen who lives in Hawaii and has flowing hair named Johnny Kapahala, and he just lives on a beach in Hawaii with his grandfather and surfs all day. I don't even think he goes to school. He's just homeschooled by the ocean, and he just surfs all day long. And I remember thinking that would be incredible if that was my life. Um, well, I took Bevo everywhere with me, including when I would brush my teeth at the end of the night. And there is a particular time in this story that I remember where I went into the bathroom to brush my teeth with Bevo. And I had always known that we had a toilet, but I never quite noticed it like I did in that moment. And I remember thinking, what if Bevo Capahala? And I did the mathematics, before you think I'm a terrible person, okay, I did the mathematics behind it. There is a small circle at the bottom. So the cardboard pizza box that I cut out was a square. It makes sense. The, the square that I then taped Bevo Capahala to. <laughs> and I did the mathematics, but I didn't do the science behind it. And the science behind it is that when cardboard gets wet, it, <laughs> goodbye Bevo Capahala. To which, of course, I run out to my mom, say, what in the name of science just happened? And she explains to me that Bevo has now gone to the great pipeline in the sky. And this was my honest first encounter with death. And I no, it's technically a, a murder, but that's not what we're talking about this morning. <laughs> but what I'm here to tell you is that it wasn't my last encounter with it. And I distinctly remember losing family members. Uh, I distinctly remember losing close friends. Uh, I remember losing my music teacher in fifth grade. None hit quite as close to home as when I watched my father lose a half a year battle to cancer. The reality is in a room this size, some of you have experienced that close loss. Maybe some of you have never experienced a loss that close in your life, but the truth is that we are all connected by the reality that one day we will experience death and the fact that one day our time on earth will come to an end. One day we will take our last breath. Death is a reality, 
But oftentimes, whether it's consciously or subconsciously, we tend to push it to the back of our minds and, and don't really think about it. Ash Wednesday is a day where we confront this reality and realize that we are mortal, we are humans, and no matter the, the accolades that we store up here on earth, all of our headstones are gonna be decorated the same. <laughs> With the year that we were born, the year that we died, and a small dash in the middle. And the reality is, is that that dash is not an infinite line. It will come to an end as far as our time on earth here goes. But if you're like me, maybe Ash Wednesday isn't something that you always grew up participating in. Maybe you've never participated in it before, but it's important for us to, to look at what exactly it is, right? Why are we here today? What is the meaning of behind it. And when we look kind of back at the history of it, we, we understand, well, first, Ash Wednesday is the start of the 40-day season of Lent, and it's technically 47 days. Uh, the Sundays in Lent don't count towards it. Instead, they are uh, miniature celebrations as we prepare for the grand celebration that is Easter at the, end, at the end of the Lent season, where Christ conquers death once and for all, giving us that hope. And the, the 40 is significant because this is the amount of time that Jesus spent in the wilderness before his ministry started fasting. This is why people will choose to fast from something during the Lent season. What Ash Wednesday is not, and I want you to hear me say this, what Ash Wednesday is not, is it is not a public display of our own personal holiness. It doesn't put us on a pedestal. In fact, the heart behind it is, is quite the opposite. It's a reminder of our connection with humanity. Seven to eight billion people on the face of the planet that whether we have a professing faith in Jesus Christ or whether we hate the mention of his name, we all come from the same stuff and we're going to return to it again one day. We see in Genesis, Abraham says, I who am but dust and ash. We see the result that we talked about as well in Genesis when it says to dust or to ash, we shall return. Sarah Bentley Allred explains Ash Wednesday well. When she says, Ash Wednesday provides us that rarely comfortable but certainly important opportunity to sit with our own mortality. The heart of Ash Wednesday is really two things. One, it's a reminder, a sobering reminder, that we are not in control of the fact that our time on earth will end. And two, there's action that follows it. It is also a call to repentance. Naturally, we like to be in control. And I distinctly remember the one thing that would make my mom the most angry. And there were a lot of things I did that made her angry, but this one really did it. Our driveway would back out into a busy street. So it's prime real estate. But as we would back out, it would make sense for my mom, who's the driver, to see the traffic that's coming. But I, just wanting to be the helpful mediator that I am, would stick my head in between her and the road to see who's coming and be like, are you seeing this? Do you see that truck right there? Until she would slap me in the back of the head and tell me to sit back down. This is the same reason why some of us enjoy haunted houses and some of us don't. If you like haunted houses, I don't get it, but they're fun to you. And they're fun to you because you realize this isn't real. It's fake. It's pretend. You still have a sense of control here because this isn't real. But if you're like me and you don't quite make that cognitive connection that this is all not real, when the clown jumps out in the pitch black darkness, it's not pretend that's real. It's not a guy named Dwayne who's making $4 an hour. That's a clown. 
in the pitch black darkness, which is why when he jumps out, my first reaction isn't, ha ha, again. My first reaction is fight or flight. That's why if you come to my office and jump out dressed as a clown, you will catch these hands. That's just the way that it works. <laughs> we naturally like to be in control, but it's funny that the one thing we can't control is the fact that our time on earth will come to an end. And I think that is at the root of the fear of death itself, that no matter uh, the amount of health, the amount of wealth, the amount of willpower that we can muster up, we can't escape that reality. We are human, we are mortal, we will die. But the good news is that it doesn't just have to end there for us. You see, what's accomplished at the end of the Lent season in Easter is that Christ goes to the cross, takes on the sins of the world, lays himself willingly on the altar in the form of the cross, dies, and then conquers death. The very death that we're talking about today, Christ conquers it. And because of that, we now have a hope that goes far beyond that dash on our headstone. The gospel is not just about our time here on earth. The gospel is about eternity. And when you think about that hope that we have in eternity, the pain that you may be coming in with today, the loss you may have experienced and the pain associated with it grows a little bit dimmer in the light of his glory and his grace. And this hope is a free gift that God offers us by grace through faith, as Paul would say. By grace, he gives it to us. Through faith, we receive it and enter into a relationship, a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And when we enter into a personal relationship with Jesus, our natural response is to repent. We see repentance throughout scripture, especially in the New Testament in an instance where we see John the Baptist who's preparing for the Messiah, the Savior, to come. And he's going around and he's proclaiming, he's declaring, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. We see it come full circle when Christ himself walks around and says, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. It's a declaration that the Savior the Messiah is here. But what does it mean to, to truly repent? Because I believe that we know part of it, but there may be a part that we, we tend to miss. Repentance is, is turning from something. You turn from darkness. You turn from bondage. You turn from your old way of life. You turn from Sin, and I feel like we have the knowledge of that part down. But what I'm afraid that we sometimes tend to forget is that repentance is not just turning from something, it's turning to something else. It's turning from walking in darkness and it's turning to walking in the light. It's turning from the bondage and turning to walking in freedom. It's turning from the old way of life turning to the new one. It's turning to Christ, period. It's turning to Christ. It's turning to Christ who offers us the freedom from feeling like we have to control everything. It's turning to Christ who's already cast your sin far away from you into oblivion because he loves you perfectly and he finds you infinitely valuable. It's turning to Christ who makes the acknowledgement of our own mortality bearable because he already conquered death and he offers us the same resurrection that we are preparing to celebrate at Easter. You turn from something you turn to something else. Friends, what Christ is offering us to turn to is far greater than what we're leaving behind. My challenge to you in this Lent season would be if you do choose to take part 
in fasting from something, and I, and I hope that you do. If you choose to, to fast from something, whether it be some type of food or some type of drink or something that normally occupies a lot of your time, whatever you choose to do, that in the same heart of repentance, it wouldn't be just turning from doing something, but you would turn to something else. In turn, you would turn to seeking more of Christ. That you wouldn't just not do or not partake in something for the sake of of not doing it or not partaking in it. But that you would truly seek more of God. And I pray that you take practical steps to do that. Maybe for you this morning, if you're honest, maybe your time in the word has, has declined. Maybe if you're honest this morning, maybe it's not really existent right now. Maybe for you, it's a Bible reading plan, structured time in God's word. If you were to read any of the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, if you were to read half a chapter a day, you would finish by Easter. Maybe for you, it's an, it's an opportunity to connect more with God in prayer, through prayer. Kyle gave a great message on it a couple weeks ago. I would urge you to go back and watch it. Lynn provides a great opportunity to put the jumper cables on your prayer life. Maybe for you, it's joining a grow group. We have a lot of grow groups, communities that you can plug into through reading God's word, seeking God alongside fellow believers who are on the same journey as you are. And maybe if we're being really honest today, maybe you're here this morning, maybe you were here on Christmas, maybe you'll be here at the end of Easter, but maybe not as much in between. Now, what I would urge you and challenge you to do is to plug in to a church. Plug in to a body of believers who, again, are on the same journey as you are. One of the greatest resources that God has given us is community, the people around us. And I would challenge you to plug in to that community. But the reminder for us in this season that we're not just turning from something, we're turning to Christ. Christ is far better than what we're leaving behind. Let me pray for us. Father God, we thank you that you are a God who made a way for us to be reconnected with you again. The very creation that chose sin over you. God, we thank you for the love that you have for us, the grace that you show us. God, I pray in this season of Lent that again, we wouldn't just turn from something, but God, we would seek after you wholeheartedly that we would realize that the breath that we have in our lungs today is a gift from you. I pray that we wouldn't take it for granted, but we would seek after you with everything that we have today. Thank you that you are a God who offers us hope far beyond when our time on earth here ends. And when we think about that eternity, that dash on our headstone seems a little bit smaller in the scope of eternity that you offer us. God, we love you. We pray all this in your name. Amen.